Welcome to Money Matters. I'm Emily Johnson, Certified Financial Planner and Managing Director of Polaris Capital Advisors. We'll be joined later today by Todd McGarity, Equity Portfolio Strategist at Polaris, to address a lot of questions that we've been receiving from viewers, investors about the equity markets and all the volatility that we've seen over the last couple of weeks. But before we get into that, I'd like to just give a brief overview of what we're seeing in the market right now as we're filming today on Tuesday, uh, September the 6th. Obviously, today we're having a very volatile morning and uh, we've had a very volatile few weeks. A lot of that, at least over Labor Day weekend, has been focused on what's going on in Europe. We thought or we hoped that some of the European debt situation might have uh, subsided as uh, we've seen a lot of the austerity packages be passed in Greece, in Italy, etc. However, it seems to be continuing. Uh, one of the big problems that we're seeing with that and the reason that it seems to be continuing is because a lot of sovereign debt of the European countries, Greece, Portugal, Spain, Italy, etc., are held by European banks specifically banks, healthy banks in Germany and France. So unlike the United States, where a lot of United States debt is actually held abroad, say by the Chinese, Arab countries, et cetera, a lot of European debt is actually held by European banks. So that's exacerbating this problem. And now we're seeing a lot of concern over Germany's health and whether or not Germany's credit rating can withstand uh, what's going to happen in Greece, in Italy, et cetera. So it definitely, this, this contagion that we kept hearing about in Europe is continuing. And that's certainly what is causing what's happening today on Tuesday uh, in the market anyway, the declines that we've seen thus far this morning. So looking at uh, yet again a very volatile week and um, hopefully we will answer some more of your questions today as far as how to position yourself going into this week. Uh, look forward to doing that in just a minute. We'll be joined by Todd McGarity. Before we get to that, we're going to have our Mortgage Minute with David Kroll and I look forward to seeing you back here in just a few minutes. I'm Emily Johnson and this is Money Matters. Hello, this is David Kroll from Mortgage Network and I'm here for the Mortgage Minute. Uh, my topic today is the shape and size of the Hilton Head market to give you a sense of what's going on. 126 properties sold uh, last month, August. 100 of those were below 600,000. A sprinkle between 600 and a, and a million, another sprinkle between one and two million, and two properties over two million. What's interesting is that all of the 100 below six. $600,000, all of that 100 properties would have been able to be financed with conforming mortgages. 95% of all the mortgages written in the United States today are conforming mortgages. That means mortgages of $417,000 or less. And Hilton Head, which is an upscale market, seems to be fitting right into that slot. Back to Money Matters. I'm Emily Johnson and I'm joined today by equity portfolio strategist Todd McGarity of Polaris Capital Advisors. I asked Todd to join us today because we've received a lot of really interesting questions from viewers regarding how to position their equity portfolios in this volatile market. Obviously, as we just talked about in the opening, we've had a very volatile and a very negative August and we are now entering yet another very volatile month even though we're early in September as we film this on Tuesday, September the 6th we're still having and, and experiencing a very volatile September and thus far negative. So I think they're very apt questions. We're going to try to address all of those questions throughout this discussion today. So first and foremost, given the negative market that we've been in, how would you suggest people position themselves? Would you suggest they make changes right now? Should they succumb to the fear trade? I mean, what, what do you think? Well, I think uh, it's important to ask yourself in the beginning of the month to the end of the month, if you see a large amount of volatility that happens within you know, a one week period, like mm -hmm. we've seen, these 300, 400 point swings. You Which know, used to be, I mean, they, they used to be an anomaly. Now that's becoming 
old hat. You see 300, 400 points, and while it's still gut-wrenching, absolutely, you're becoming conditioned as both an investor and an investment advisor to accept it. Well, I think it's it's more about the information flow, number one, and number two, it's more about a lot of high-frequency trading that we see. Um, you know, okay, let's stop the there for a second. So high-frequency trading, meaning high-volume trading, um, just discuss that for just a second. Well, high-frequency trading essentially consists of moving large amounts of blocks based on algorithms um, that are computer executed, programs, computer program trading, um, and it tends to move a large amount of uh, money very quickly, mm -hmm. um, thereby making very small margins for um, for certain investors or houses. So set as up a result, that. and they're, since they're triggered by some kind of a computer algorithm, you're going to see large large blocks of stock moving in and out of the market quickly, therefore driving the market in a much larger magnitude than you would otherwise see with just a retail investor exactly. or other institutional investors. And this is magnified when, when momentum tends to be um, to really move in one direction is when you start to see um, a lot of these high frequency uh, trades come in. Yeah, really it seems like it happens more short. on the negative, though, than on the positive, because I mean, we'll see in that witching hour between 3 and 4, and now it seems like it's between 3.30 and 4, we'll see the market, say, down 200 points. Next thing we know, it's down 500 points. Sure. But rarely when we're up 200 points do we see it go up 500 points. It well, does seem to be driven the other way. The fear, and the reason is, is fear is much stronger than, than greed when it mm -hmm. comes to, uh, you know, when it comes to the trading question. So a lot of times it's easier to get momentum you right. know, going on a fear trade than it is uh, anything else. So this that's their favorite, you know, their favorite sort of, uh, you know, circumstance. Which so. I think brings us back to what we were talking about in the beginning. You know, the world has not changed substantially in the last 30 to 60 days. So why is it then that we have seen, depending on which index you look at, why is it that we've seen a 20 to 25 percent move in right. the S&P and the Russell 2000, given that most news is already priced into the market. Why are we seeing, you know, so much, so much change? Well, I, I think what's somewhat frightening uh, for a lot of people is that, um, you know, these moves can can tend to have be self fulfilling prophecies. Right. Once uh, once you get a market panic where you know you get a thousand point drop in the Dow in, mm -hmm. a, in a matter of days. Well, in, you're in right, a, has in a market where changed. people have already been through two thousand and eight, and they just can't necessarily stomach yep. the same declines that they saw. And you're right about it. has that much changed in that amount of time? And the answer is no, it hasn't. But mm -hmm. it will if we start getting gap downs right. in the market like that. People tend to freeze. And talk sort of about panic. that self fulfilling prophecy for a minute, because I know this is something you and I talk about a lot at the office, but. You know, so right now you see uh, a negative market. You have, uh, you know, some negative economic news. We still do have positive economic news, but you're right. right. It does seem to sort of feed on itself. So talk about that progression. As far as you know, we have a negative few days in the market. Uh, you know, a five percent decline. What then sort of continues that progression down? Well, I think the the paper wealth effect um, right. is is something we talk about all the mm -hmm. time is something we see dealing with retail clients. Talk about that paper wealth. I mean, it, you know, you, you of course get your statement. It says you have a sure. million dollars in the bank, then suddenly you have $800,000 in the bank. What does that do to you as a well, consumer? I think, I think if, um, you know, as anybody can attest to who's opened that statement for a, you know, a statement mm -hmm. shock of, geez, you know, my, my account dropped, they might have a, a little bit different um, outlook on their spending for that month, for that mm -hmm. year for uh, maybe big expenses that they end up putting off. Or back to school spending, like right. we're seeing now in September, which are are okay, but historically lower than they would exactly. have been. Exactly. So while investors say they're long-term focused, it still doesn't, um, it still does have an impact when they open that statement and see it. It does change spending patterns. And so since they're not spending, money's not going into corporations, therefore corporate earnings go down, they have to readjust those earnings, expectations, and then the market continues to, to decline. That's exactly so right. So that's our self-fulfilling prophecy that we always talk sure. about. Sure, and that's why, you know, that's what happened essentially that fed on itself in 08 um, mm -hmm. to create a, a near collapse. Um, you know, what's out there right now because of the volatility short term in the market, um, that that could tend to have some pretty negative, uh, you know, circumstances uh, so, on short-term spending patterns. So, so back to that, then. I mean, most investors are in it for the long term. I mean, certainly we have you know day traders, et cetera. But I, I would assume that most of the viewers, and certainly the questions that we get, seem to be from people that are invested for the long term, either currently retired, looking to build up retirement savings. For those individuals, how would you suggest that they be positioned right now? And I know you sort of led into this before, before I cut you off. <laughs> so. um, I think uh, I think right now, what's important is you got to stay focused on the long term goal right. of whatever your long term goal is, whatever your long term theme is, and it's easy to let the noise, um, you know, kind of get in the way, especially as an equity, you know, portfolio manager. Mm -hmm. 
um, that noise is very loud. It's very loud uh, through the news media and news outlets. Mm -hmm. And it's important to say, you know, just what we talked about, how much has changed from last week to this week? Is my theme still valid? Um, given changes in the you know the micro environments and macro and you know environments. So speaking of so micro environment, macro environment. Of course, one you know one strategy is to have say seventy five percent of your portfolio in sort of a core strategy, uh, you know whatever based on your risk allocation, et cetera, and then say 25% that's more tactical, that's looking at short-term opportunities. Is that how you look at the, you sure. know, at your portfolio? And, and as far as the tactical part of your portfolio, what are the opportunities that you're seeing right now? Well, I think when you, when you have this kind of volatility, this kind of volatility, believe it or not, can, uh, can be a huge advantage on short-term gains. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something we use uh, from time to time, given um, you know market panics or negative noise out there that gets to an extreme level. Well, like when we see a 10% decline over the course of three days, which is historically sure. <laughs> unprecedented. Sure, or you start to see, more um, common. you know, financials are, are, is one area that we have talked about. Um, that uh, it's starting to get a little bit irrational out mm -hmm. there. Um, you're starting to see a lot of these banks trading below book value. Now I know book value is called into question and mm -hmm. and that, but um, overall I think um, delinquents, uh, delinquencies are going down. Corporate balance sheets look uh, better mm -hmm. than they ever have. So the reserve requirements on banks are way up. So a lot of these banks are overcapitalized to a great extent and uh, really have looked better from a capital um, standpoint. Of course, they've hoarded it all for that reason. Let's but, get uh, back to banks here in just a second. I want to address one last question before we finish up this segment here. One of the questions that we got, I just want to make sure that we fit in here, is what does range-bound trading mean? And it's a, it's a common phrase that we hear on uh, CNBC, et cetera, all the time. So tell me, within the S&P, tell me what range-bound trading means. Well, I mean, typically the market trades within technical parameters. Um, it's, it's, a, it's really a, a term used in technical analysis that really defines an upper um, mm -hmm. an a upper ceiling. resistance level mm -hmm. and a you know lower support level and so, right now so generally it trades within that trend and while it may not be a, an important number to a lot of people uh, there's a lot of people running a lot of money out there institutional mm -hmm. that um, that's, that play close attention to uh, to those numbers so despite all the volatility it does seem that we are still trading within that range and I know we have a uh, we just go from the top of the range to the bottom of the range right. and, and vice versa very quickly and the, and the the speed um, to which we do that now is is really incredible. Well, I don't want to cut you off because we're going to come back and discuss that a little bit more here in a second. But thank okay. you very much for all your information. Great. And we'll be right back in just a second with Todd McGarity. I'm Emily Johnson. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Money Matters. I'm again joined by Todd McGarity, Equity Portfolio Strategist at Polaris Capital Advisors. And we have been addressing viewer questions through our, our commentary and conversation on the market right now. One question that we've received um, several times from viewers is relating to bank and financial stocks. I'm sure a lot of individuals not only work with large financial institutions, but also invest in them. So talk to me a little bit, Todd, about why it is that banks have been hit so hard over the last 30 days or so. You would assume that a lot of the negative information has been priced in, but we're getting back to 2008 levels when it comes sure. to bank valuations, investment bank valuations. Right. What's going on with that? Well, I think it's, uh, it's you know, simply put, it's this housing, uh, the housing market just lives on. I mean, it, um, th this has been an issue, obviously, since uh, the near collapse in 08. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's still some question out there about, um, and uncertainty about just how many bad loans are yeah, out it's there. It's interesting you should say that because we had Kathy Olivetti on the show not too long ago and she specializes in foreclosures and short sales mm -hmm. and she said you know a couple years ago she thought that she had a, you know about 15 years that this was going to continue. She she continue, she assumes now several years later that it's still going to go on for 15 years sure. and she's very much on the know and that's just our local market. Right. So. right. Um, I think a lot of that is um, is the reason some of these financials have been hit hard. It's important to realize you know a couple of things really is the consumer is, 
you know, beginning a deleveraging process and really has been since 08. Mm -hmm. And that deleveraging, uh, you know. A personal deleveraging. That's exactly they're right. They're paying it's, down their credit cards. They're doing all the things that the U.S. government isn't it, doing by it, increasing the debt exactly limit. That's exactly right. Yes. Um, but personal balance sheets are looking a little bit better. There are a lot less, there's a lot less leverage out there because there's a lot less credit mm -hmm. um, out there. So one thing you got to remember is banks, you know, right now, it's just not advantageous really for banks to loan long term right now as much as it is when because that yield curve is Because long term interest high. rates are so low. Right. You've had the Fed that has kept, you know, uh, interest rates, especially in the 10 year and under maturities, Mature. has kept them, um, you know, kept uh, those those maturities uh, very so low. So banks are paying out interest at almost nothing, but they're also loaning out money next to nothing. They don't have that spread That's exactly that they right. used to have when, say, short term rates were 3% and 10 year was at 6%, and they had that spread mm -hmm. in between. They no longer have that. Exactly. And that because of that spread, that yield spread, um, that the money they take in versus the money they loan, mm -hmm. um, that spread is, is historically small right now, and that, um, that tends to weigh on banks' earnings. Um, so it's, Not I think to mention it's that. the lawsuits that are coming down the pike as far exactly. as the mortgages goes. I'm sure that's exactly. a large So amount. you've got a flat yield curve. Mm -hmm. um, you have uh, the deleveraging the consumer mm -hmm. uh, or lack of demand for credit um, mm -hmm. across the board. And you also have the fear of, um, you know, these mortgage-related, you know, mm -hmm. uh, problems that they've it's got, the loans and, uh, you know, the litigation. Aspect. But, you know, that said, banks have, depending on which bank you're looking at, obviously, but as a, as a sector, is down anywhere from 20 to 30 percent, right. and yet they're still healthier now than they were in 2008, and valuations are back to 2008 levels. So right. what does that say to you? Well, eventually, you know, this situation, you know, swings in the other direction mm -hmm. or corrects, right? I mean, it's... Mm -hmm. You it know, has it, to. Historically, well, I shouldn't say that's, it has to. Well, historically, it is it has proven to be the case that eventually mm -hmm. this will pass, and we will start to see the economy pick up. Um, we will start, you know, start to see the consumer back out there again. The demand for credit start to pick mm -hmm. up. And we'll start to see banks loaning again, which will, in fact, uh, push the yield curve higher and will steepen the yield curve. And I know one thing that you've said many times is that banks have to lead us out and typically do, historically do, lead us out of recessions, bear markets, whatever you want to sure. you know, call we're in right now. A lot of people believe that, that banks don't have to lead us or the financials mm -hmm. don't have to lead us. I'm a big believer that that's... They uh, have to start lending. That's yeah. exactly. That's mm -hmm. the source of capital for uh, which fuels, you know, the engine of growth. So, and so I, I think that has to happen, and I think it will happen. Um, I just think right now you're getting rates held um, artificially low by, you know, some of these QE programs that the Fed is uh, embarking on. So that would just, you know, very quickly, that, that would be an opportunity maybe is something that you'd look at is banks right now are probably artificially... Um, low as from a pricing perspective in my opinion yes mm -hmm. I think um, I think it's a great time to use this panic type situation with the European you know debt mm -hmm. crisis um, I think it's a great time to use this situation to start to um, start to move into some of these US banks and maybe you know build some uh, some cost mm -hmm. you know kind of dollar cost average into these these banks that have been really hit based on European concerns. Mm -hmm. so. I, I tried just be, in, in preparing for this show because I knew this was going to be a topic that we were going to address because we re, we've received a lot of um, investor questions or viewer mm -hmm. questions about this. So I tried to actually create a diagram. Hopefully this is somewhat helpful. The teacher in me is attempting to do this. Um, as we talk about banks always leading us out of, of a recession, of a trough, say, in the market, um, let's take a look here at a market cycle, a typical market cycle that shows a decline or a recession. The bottom of a recession is typically called a trough, and then you have an expansion as you lead back into a growth market. And typically in that, one of the, the types of companies that lead us out, banks and also high dividend yielding, which used to be banks, high dividend yielding value stocks typically start to lead us out. After that, you're typically follow, followed by large cap growth stocks. Um, those are going to be lower dividend yielding, more growth oriented, but still larger company blue chip type stocks. And then after that, you have small and mid cap companies. The reason for that, banks start lending, smaller companies have access to capital, therefore they start growing, and typically they grow at a faster rate. Right. So I wanted to put together that diagram because we always talk about banks leading us out of a recession. We've also heard a lot about high dividend yielding stocks being sort of the defense area that people are going to. But I really want to talk about small and mid-cap companies because I know that's something that you favor and in the last couple of weeks that you know that has just been fluctuating small mid-cap sure. indexes, the Russell 2000, the Russell 1000, all over the place. So tell me a little bit about why you favor small and mid-cap companies in this environment and how you're playing that position. Well, a lot of it is, is what you had just mentioned. Um, you know, the small to mid-cap... I mid -cap, thunder. I'm sorry. <laughs> the small to mid-cap uh, sector generally is um, the, the rebound from the trough to expansion, as you 
spoke mm-hmm. about. Um, generally, the highest degree of return is through those small and mid cap sectors. Now, wh- why is that? Um, I believe because of the higher growth rate mm-hmm. is, you know, obviously is a uh, major component. But also because they get, you know, they uh, during the correction they pull back more, more. which makes they're more, more volatile. Sure, and they're mm-hmm. a lot more uncomfortable to buy during a time like this because mm-hmm. of the volatility. Mm-hmm. However, with the evolution of the ETF, um, exchange traded fund, exactly, mm-hmm. we can uh, we can participate uh, without single stock exposure that that makes owning small and mid caps sometimes uh, so painful. Mm-hmm. So we can participate in that sector, build an, an average cost uh, going in with an ETF. Um, and usually uh, really enhance the return of a portfolio coming from, uh, from the trough to expansion. So right now as we're seeing sort of the, uh, the range bound trading so to speak but presumably at the bottom of this range right now in a ton of volatility you would suggest that people perhaps take a position if they don't yet have it or expand their position in bank stocks would be one that you would suggest. Absolutely and, I, and let, me just, let me just say that during a time like this when the news is so negative, mm-hmm. when you when the uh, you know the negative news is so loud, and everybody is throwing in, you know, the towel on banks, it really except selling, Warren Buffett. Except that's, Warren Buffett. That's exactly <laughs> right, and I think we'd all do uh, well to follow. Mm-hmm. Um, but essentially, um, you know, during those uh, during these times like this, it's it's hard to buy emotionally, which is one of mm-hmm. the reasons you have a financial advisor. Mm-hmm. Um, is you know to get you past that emotional block mm-hmm. because generally those yield the best returns when everybody's selling you want to be buying. All right. Well, we are going to uh, end this segment here very quickly. We'll be back in just a minute. I'm going to pick Todd's brain a little bit more on one more strategy uh, that we want to use based on a viewer's question going into these very volatile markets. Please uh, join us here in just a minute. I'm Emily Johnson, joined by Todd McGarity, and we will be right back. Welcome back to Money Matters. I'm again joined by Todd McGarity to discuss one last parting shot or idea uh, that we wanted to address based on a viewer's question, and that was concerning a concentrated position. This viewer had um, one position in GE that was very large and thousands and thousands of shares, and it makes up a huge percentage of his net worth. Um, He owns it at a very low cost basis, and he wants to maximize that position given the volatility in the market right now. He wants to cover his downside, but he's also really concerned about selling it because he doesn't want the tax hit right now. So how would you suggest that he play or take advantage of the volatility and also cover his downside right now? Um, Well, the first and most obvious choice is, um, you know, is don't be afraid to use Options. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of uh, a lot of investors hear the word option and they immediately associate Fear. it with risk. Right. And uh, the you know the reality is is a lot of people use options to hedge risk. Mm-hmm. Um, so they hedge their downside and essentially you could do it. Um, you know, one of two ways you can actually um, you can actually write a covered call. Mm-hmm. And I have a diagram that will be up now or later, but it's going to address the things that mm-hmm. I think Todd is going to talk about. And we use covered calls a lot to enhance mm-hmm. overall return of a portfolio, but you also can, instead of keeping that a premium, uh, the premium income that you write from the call, you can also use that premium to buy a put contract. Which effectively, you know, according to this diagram, when you say write a covered call, you effectively are selling somebody the right to purchase that stock from you, and for that you're receiving, you the owner of the stock, are receiving a premium income. Exactly. Okay, so you're generating extra income on a position that you already own. That's exactly right. Okay. Um, so instead of uh, keeping that a premium in the account, which a lot of times we do just to enhance return, we sell forward, um, you know, a month the contract, maybe mm-hmm. two months, depending on uh, where the best yield is. Mm-hmm. But um, instead of keeping that in the account, um, you would protect a downside. You would use that premium, either all of it or some of it, to protect a uh, downside strike price or a downside floor under the stock, okay. where you would essentially start profiting on the option below a certain price, equal to the value of shares. So we have two different things that you would suggest. One is generating that extra income, say you generate an extra dollar, as we do in our example, so that if the market goes down or if the price of that stock goes down a dollar, you're net flat. The other thing you would do is do that, bring in that dollar, but use a portion of that dollar to buy protection on the downside or to create a floor under your position. Exactly. It's a partial okay. hedge. You can write the cover call, and that will offset you know whatever the amount of the premium is and downside of stock okay. on the stock. But um, you know if you if you're really concerned about a much lower level, 
um, or a panic type situation, then you want to uh, use that premium to, uh, to actually turn around and, and purchase a, uh, a put protection. Yeah. Okay. Well, so. thank you very much. That's obviously a very sophisticated strategy and something requiring an equity portfolio strategist <laughs> to manage. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you very much for joining us today. Those are our last parting shots today, our action items that uh, we might suggest for any individuals that have uh, cover, or that, I'm sorry, that have concentrated positions. Uh, Please check us out on Facebook. Please send us questions. We really do enjoy receiving them. Thank you very, very much to those of, us, those of you that have sent us questions. Definitely helps us to direct our show going forward, make sure that we're addressing your questions, your needs. So check us out on Facebook. Please send me emails at emily uh, at polariscapitaladvisors.com or todd at polariscapitaladvisors.com. Look forward to seeing you next week. Again, I'm Emily Johnson. This has been Money Matters. Have a great week.